I think you're live. Yeah, we are. We are. Mm -hmm. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, today is, how can we forget what today is? 9-11, um, 2023. Um, <clears throat> around the table, and this is a regular uh, city council workshop. Around the table, we have Councilor Pelletier, Councilor Sprague, Councilor Schaefer, Councilor Hawes, Councilor Yakabaga. On the room, we have Councilor Davitt, myself, Councilor Fournier. Um, also at the table is uh, City Manager Deb Lori. Uh, first up on the agenda is the uh, cross insurance uh, year in review, and I see uh, Chris, in the audience, so I thought he might step forward and have a seat at the big boy table. <laughs> hey, brave dog. Real dog. Dog. <laughs> brave dog. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm the general manager of the Cross Insurance Center. I'm Doug Higgins. I'm a senior vice president with Oakview Group. Um, just by way of history, and we're just talking. <laughs> Sue um, been involved with the facility for ten years. We're excited about the tenth anniversary of the building. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about, about that. Um, but really, it's just from from a company standpoint and a, and a personal standpoint. Uh, you know, I remember being here for the groundbreaking, um, and it's just really we're really proud of what the building's become for both the community and for the industry. Um, it really is. It's an important account for. Um, our company. It's an important account for me personally. And I'm, again, proud of the success we've had, proud of the fact that we've been able to take Chris has started in group sales and just grown over the 10 years of the building to be the general manager. So turn over to Chris, go through the, the, the last fiscal year, and then uh, talk about the fair and the future. So. And it will add that this used to be a regular staple feature where we did an annual review and it kind of the pandemic waylaid a whole bunch of things, but with Chris back, we're, Those we're back to do it. And we have an electronic version, and we'll make sure that it's added to the website. Yep. Okay. So we're going to start here on page seven. Um, we'll jump right into some of the facility improvements that we've done over the course of the last year. Uh, <clears throat> So right here, we, um, we've kind of jumped back into, you know, the, some folks know the HVAC system control upgrade that we did through capital funding. Um, we've done some boiler maintenance and repairs. Third floor improvements was a big push for us this past fiscal year, um, mainly due to the demand for suites. And um, we, as everybody knows, we had 13 suites prior to um, our remodel and rethinking and improvements. And now we have 16. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit deeper, but 15 out of 16 are currently under contract um, as of the end of this fiscal year. So um, it was one of those efforts to um, provide more of a premium space for our customers um, based off of the demand. Um, some additional improvements, painting in certain areas that are uh, a focal point for us, um, convention center space, um, not new colors, just a refresh of the current space um, to give that new clean feel. Um, safety equipment upgrades and um, stanchions, other improvements for the facility to really help us drive our um, our events and, and be successful as a whole. Um, next page, we'll, we'll go into you know, our, our team is, is phenomenal and we have 20 uh, current full-time positions. Um, I can't speak, you know, any higher of our team. They're phenomenal. They're the, the reason why our events really take place. And, um, you know, from um, everybody, every department, it, it really acts as a, as a mechanism for success. And um, this is based off of our current, you know, last fiscal year, our, our, you know, full transparency, our, our team has shifted. It's changed a little bit um, as of just two months into this fiscal year. We've seen kind of a reorg already, um, but it's all for the better good of, of the of, uh, the event center and, and taking care of our events and, and more focus on certain areas where we can see growth. Arena events. Um, 
we over the past year we've hosted a variety of of uh arena ticketed events um several sold out shows uh from Burt Kreischer professional bull riders Greta Van Fleet Parker McCollum and the list goes on a lot of this success comes from our OVG Live Nation relationships um promoter relationships in general are profiting because of OVG and the connections. Um, Burt Kreischer um, is one example here where it's a sold out show. He's never been in the market and the promoter that brought us that show had never been in our building 10 years and, and has never been in our building. So this is all a success for us. It's based off of our relationships that we're, we're growing because of our affiliation with OVG. Um, this year, our, our strongest PBR year to date, 11,000 plus paid tickets, 608,000 gross revenue plus the ancillary revenues that come from it, um, shows that this event still six years later is doing better and better and better as it comes. And we have um, silently announced it. They announced their entire tour. So this show will be returning in, the, in March of 2020. So um, it'll be returning. It's one of the two events on the Velocity Tour that acts as a three-day weekend, which speaks volumes to our market and to the success that we continue to see from this event. We've had theatrical shows, family shows. Shrine Circus continues to come back and continues to be successful. Um, comedy shows, concerts. And, you know, the beauty of this space is it gives us the ability to offer a, a, ride, a wide range of of uh, events that our folks and our patrons can enjoy. At the bottom here, and we'll touch a little bit on it in a, in a presentation after this, but the Bangor State Fair um, in fiscal year 23 is still growing. And we saw 15,000 plus folks um, in a four day span. We had great weather all four days of this year. Um, unfortunately, I can't say the same for the one that we had last month. Um, but we, we're still seeing success with that. And we're this fiscal year, we brought back the truck pulls and the demolition derby. We brought a uh, smaller tractor pull um, event back in it, and it helps drive our attendance. Main Harvest Festival continues to be one of the, the popular events that we have, community-driven events, and it continues to come back year after year. Jumping into the convention center, um, this space we saw 50 more events than we had in 2022 so 75 total events with 1.2 million dollars in gross revenue some of our notable notable events the governor's opioid conference we saw the return of the bangor region chamber of commerce annual awards dinner maine asphalt association the olympia snow women's leadership and the list goes on maine municipal association corporate holiday parties um this is a space that we're continuing to grow Post pandemic, we're continuing to see it um, come back from the pandemic. We welcome 30 new events um, that had never been in the facility before, and we're excited for the future here. Just to take off on that, just it's interesting having two different, distinct different facilities on the one roof, the arena. That business post pandemic came back almost immediately. Um, we, we likened it to the Roaring Twenties, that everyone was pent up indoors for, for so long, they wanted to get out and see live events. So what we saw as an industry is concerts and family shows and touring events came back and people are buying tickets now more than ever for all events. Convention and meeting business is taking years to build back from the pandemic because people are doing virtual meetings still and still we're still replacing that. So the fact that we've been able to grow from the previous fiscal year, 50 plus events last fiscal year and I keep growing this year, that really shows that we're on the right tra trajectory again. Mm -hmm. And from a ticketing partner standpoint, um, Ticketmaster is our uh, verified partner. Um, any ticketed event that happens at the facility will go through Ticketmaster. We have a favorable ticketing deal with Ticketmaster based off of, once again, our, our OVG corporate relationships. Um, we sold 152,000 plus tickets up from um, up 23.2% in FY22. So we're seeing growth there, $5.2 million in gross ticket revenue, up 42% from the previous fiscal year. 
We're starting to see a rise again in our group sales. We're starting to see a rise again in our pre-show packaging, things that we do prior to the show, pre-show dinners, cocktail hours. We're utilizing uh, new spaces in the facility. Um, we're starting to do things on the third floor with um, uh, dinners prior to a show, Cirque du Soleil Corteo. Um, we're starting to, to really drive this business again because it gives folks something to do prior to the event, additional revenue, um, but also getting people in the facility quicker. Um, they're in the parking lots quicker. It's alleviating a lot of that pressure that we're seeing. Our top three group events, professional bull riders, the Bangor State Fair, and Cirque du Soleil. Um, so PBR is one of our long running group uh, events. It's 10 or more. Um, generally, you're seeing discounts here. So this is a way for us to generate ancillary revenue, really drive clumpings of tickets. Um, and the more events we add, the more uh, family show events, we'll start to see this, uh, this number continue to climb. From food service and hospitality, this is arguably one of the most impressive things that we've had over this past fiscal year. We saw a 50% increase in our gross food and beverage revenue, um, largely because of our increase in events, but we're seeing things, um, you know, our, our ancillary food and beverage numbers increase because of our um, cashless operation. And if everybody remembers, we presented a year ago around this time about going cashless. And that was one of our big corporate initiatives with OBG. And we're seeing a lot of our other venues have success with it. It allows us to push people through lines quicker. It allows us to, um, to get more in our patrons' hands. They're getting more excited. They're going to the event. They're not frustrated. Um, and our food and beverage world from a catering standpoint, the convention center space, we have a food and beverage manager that's pushing upsells. They're driving um our business with creative menus instead of the old standard chicken chicken uh, <laughs> so it's it's really allowing us to grow as a whole and we're seeing it here uh 50 increase in our gross food and beverage and a three hundred fifty three thousand dollar increase in concession specific revenue that's our arena ticketed business between the two fiscal years one of our event highlights here is the fourth annual main opioid response summit um, mainly because it was our one of our very first events in the fiscal year, but also because we did 1,100 plus people in a food buffet in less than 30 minutes. And if anybody's gone to one of those major events, uh, there's always worry that what if we run out of food or what if you know the next session starts? Um, we had, I think, eight different buffet stations with lines coming every which way. And it was a true testament to the, the food and beverage team and how they were able to accomplish that. So we're excited about that. Um, the next bit, tenant partners, um, University of Maine basketball still continues to play some of their home games at the facility, MPA tournament. Um, you know, this is a, an event that every year, February, town shut down and they'll come to the facility in central Maine and Augusta and Portland as well. But for us, it's, it's a incredible eight days. Um, we saw almost 40,000 people come through the facility. And the last bit here, we saw uh, John Baps play their entire home game uh, season at our facility. And we worked with them creatively to provide a, um, a decent rate, but also balancing their games between times we had the basketball court down for things like Harlem Globetrotters or UMaine basketball. So, um, and I believe also they're playing their entire season at the Cross Center this year as well. This portion right here, the corporate partnerships. Um, so out of all OVG managed properties, we were the highest percentage to goal variance. So we build $1.2 million in fiscal year 23. We saw 15 new partnerships. Um, many of you know, Renewal by Anderson is one of our biggest partners at this point um, with their name on the door and they have uh, their lower level suite. Hammond Lumber is also coming in as a naming rights partner to the former Southeast entrance right across from Residence Inn. Um, so total in those 15 new partnerships, it was close to a million dollars in total value. Again, we've uh, secured contracts for 15 out of the 16 suites that we have. 
Um, we're hopeful for uh, Sweet 16 here shortly, um, and we'll be full and looking for other ways we can create premium space. Sweet 16 is almost funny. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the last bit here, we renamed the primary convention center entrance um, as the Woodrow Cross entrance. We do have um, still to this day, the Friends of the CIC Advisory Board. Um, this uh, this advisory board, we meet on a monthly basis and um, it's a group of local citizens that are committed to the ongoing success of our facility. And um, currently, Julia Muncy is the chair and Dr. Lisa Baronis from Boston University is the vice chair um, and great relationships with both of them and they're continuing uh, uh, the support and how we can grow from a community standpoint and also an event standpoint. And the last bit here, the financial performance. So, you know, we, we saw 174 events and, um, you know, we beat budget 149,000, we beat budget by $110,000. So we saw an increase in ancillary revenue as we discussed food and beverage. Um, some of our ticketing fees and that sort of stuff. We saw um, dips and other things, but you know, as we work through still the, the pandemic um, and coming out of the pandemic, we're trying to drive these events into a more realistic approach. So, um, yeah. And then the last bit. So, you know, as we look to the future, you know, our our goal is community focused, and how can we be a better uh, facility for our community and the community partners, our founding partners, our sponsors. Um, we had yesterday a 10 year anniversary open house where we saw about 150, 200 people come through the building, utilize the space, see the space, some for the first time. Today, we hosted a 10 year anniversary um, celebratory golf tournament where the charitable component to um, a charitable organization from Bangor Police Department and the Bangor Fire Department. And as we, you know, get deeper into this fiscal year, we're really pushing um, 10 year anniversary celebration. So all of our events becoming part of the celebration, all of our events um, being highlighted by the fact that we've been open now for 10 years um, with a stamp um, winter or spring with a major 10 year anniversary show. Um, so one of the big focuses for our corporate partners and, you know, Doug and his team is really helping us solidify those events and making the facility really shine in this 10 year um, anniversary moment. That's very good. Yes, yeah. good. Any questions? Questions for Professor Doug? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris, this is all really positive in, in terms of the changes that are occurring. And I think you've been doing a great job uh, in bringing all this about. So I hear good positive things. So thank you for, uh, for all of that. And uh, it's a good partnership that we have. Um, and I was really good until I got to the financial performance page. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is, seems to indicate that we're you know, if, if this is end of the year numbers, right? Mm -hmm. That we're experiencing over a hundred thousand dollars drop in our operating margin for the year from uh, actual. Am I reading? No. No, it was a positive variance. Positive variance. Correct. Thirty-eight thousand dollars. Positive variance, yeah. Yeah. Positive nope. variance okay. is one hundred and ten. So right. we've got one hundred and forty-nine thousand dollars in net income yeah. for operating right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. That's my mistake. Uh, and then just one other quick question. Mm -hmm. We have uh, on one page on page fourteen. This is just a minor thing, but we have basketball revenue. We have fourteen thousand dollars in ticket sales and sixteen thousand tickets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So our tickets are less than a dollar a piece in terms of. So that ticket is um, all tickets issued. So they do a lot of student comps. They do a lot of okay. Um, their foundation comps, all that stuff. So, and University of Maine actually uh, oh. does their their own pricing. So okay. they'll push out group pricing, they'll push out um, their season pricing, all of that stuff. So that really encompasses all of their 
tickets, their total tickets issued instead of the paid tickets. Okay. Because they also go based off of their tickets issued so and they the full source report. of our revenue for them. So all of that ticketing money is actually theirs. There. So part of the agreement, we keep the facility fee. They pay a rent for the facility. Okay. They pay reimbursable expenses okay. and then food and beverage revenue. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dumble. Yeah, I had similar comments to Councilor Spain. I think this is a very impressive report. Um, you talked about the increase in food and beverage, and it doesn't happen by accident. It's, it's from the top down down there. I was at an event within the last year, and it was very busy. The bar was open the, in the uh, lobby area, but the main hall wasn't open yet. It was people waiting quite a while. And Chris, you came out, you opened up the hall, you opened the bars inside so people could get in, people get serviced, and you were there, you saw what was going on, you reacted to it. So this is different than we've had <laughs> experienced in the past. So it's great to see that going on. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's get one more. In, in terms of how we're looking at customer service, mm -hmm. and I know that's something you're working hard on, yeah. and that's one of the, the lower ratings of the, you know, the stars, so to speak, mm -hmm. at 4.2. Can you differentiate it all from what you've done? How much of that is related to ticketing with Ticketmaster versus the other services that people receive and stay within the facility? Yeah, so ticketing fees are you know, something that um, sometimes we control, sometimes we don't. What we can control is our ability to um, sell tickets in person, right? And um, now that we're through the summer kind of slow period, now that we have events on sale, we're starting to see more box office days and more phone call days um, to give customers the ability, skip the fees, skip all that stuff, call us direct, come in person, um, a lot of folks still like to see their hard ticket as well. Um, but really our, our goal is listening to the customers. What do they want? Um, a lot of them will buy, uh, online and we'll still hear about all these fees, all these fees, but they want the, the event tickets now, right? They don't want to run the risk of missing out on seeing somebody like, uh, Elton John or Motley Crue or professional bull rider, Burke Reicher for that matter, right? So, um, but one of the things that we're doing is we're providing more ways for them to get their tickets. And same with things like a food and beverage approach with the quicker lines and um, the third floor with allowing folks to go down or come up if they want to, um, you know, get a different um, beverage or um, if they want to skip lines and do all that stuff. And we're seeing... VIP lines um, and having a all the way to the right, our third floor, um, folks are allowed to go in on an arena show. They're allowed to go in the right hand side, but also folks can buy fast pass lanes or they can get um, VIP treatment if they buy uh, the artist VIP package um, for that event. So we're really trying to provide a, an atmosphere for people to get what they want. Um, one of the one of the things that pushes that down is our ability to get folks into parking. Um, we're trying different ways, utilizing different entrances to get folks into the parking lots quicker so they can get into the building quicker. But one of the issues we're running into is folks getting there five minutes before the show starts and then they're waiting in traffic from Main Street. Um, and how can we fix that? That's, you know, we'll continue pushing and, and trying to figure out how we can get folks in and out. But um, that's really one of the, one of the, deciding factors of that customer Good. service. It's helpful to clarify. Yeah. So 4.6 next year. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Anything else? If not, I just want to say thank you. We got the fair. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, we got the fair. All right. Yeah, <laughs> the fair. Fair, fair, yes. Okay. Uh, how do I get out of this? Uh, Cody should be able to do it for you. There you go. Okay, we'll just go from this screen here. Okay, so the Bangor State Fair. So this is a recap and uh, future recommendations. Um, and one of the reasons why we're doing this is we had a, a meeting with you folks um, uh, last, last November. Yeah, November-ish. And um, we talked about our thoughts for this coming year. Um, that has come and gone. And now we are going to recap it. 
um, some pain points that we have, and then some recommendations for the future and how we can grow this thing. So historical data, we'll start here. Um, Pre-pandemic numbers. So we we used the, the previous three years prior to the pandemic and then comparing it to post-pandemic, the three years out of pandemic. And, uh, um, and if you look at this, I mean, it, it really speaks for itself going from 10 days um, to four, we're seeing so the ability. I, I think you need to stop sharing, right? I think you could bring it up. So you need to stop share. Yeah. Me? Yes. Okay. Yep, you can. And then go back down to share. And now grab the fair one. Yeah. It didn't know that you had changed. Okay. There you go. Got it. Okay. <laughs> so we'll continue. So we got uh, pre pandemic versus post pandemic. So um, since the pandemic lifted, we've gone four <laughs> scheduled days of the fair. Some of those days have been rained out, unfortunately. Um, but we're seeing a growth in our attendance. We go from 2021 to 12,000 people up to this past year, 16,000 people. Um, we've adjusted how we do the rides and we're seeing a growth in our revenue from this year. This past year, we had these four days. So first day, truck pulls, um, we had uh, great attendance based off of historical data. We also had a great day, um, weather-wise. Day two, uh, not so much. We had the Jamison Rogers concert in the grandstand. We ended up doing about 1,300 people, but we were fighting weather all day. Um, and that became a challenge ultimately when it was our more expensive day from an entertainment standpoint and a more, um, it was a higher price uh, gate admission. And, you know, we obviously needed to collect that revenue to adjust for the expense. Day three, we saw the Demotion Derby return, always a fan favorite, um, 6,200 folks and higher than any day previous year. We also had decent weather, not the greatest. Day four, um, paid admission, 4,700. This was tractor pull day. We also, I believe, saw makeup from day two. Um, previous year, we did 1,800 people on this Sunday. Right here is a little bit of a breakdown on where we're seeing some revenue versus where we're seeing some expenses. Ultimately, we had between gate, rides, food and beverage, rent, all of our ancillary revenue, we saw about $440,000 in revenue between all of our expenses, collective expenses, including what we paid the, the Midway folks for revenue shares, $365,000. So Midway, um, this is the update here, kind of the, the ugly. Um, they promised us 22 rides, the Smokies Greater Shows. Uh, we saw 19, and out of those 19, um, seven or eight of them were um, the little little kid rides. Um, certainly not going to drive for adults, for that matter. Um, lacked quality and quantity. Um, our patrons ask for certain rides, right? And um, we're constantly saying, yep, they're going to, you know, they're going to have this. Here's the list of rides that they're saying that they are likely bringing, and then they don't. That becomes an us issue, right? We're trying to resolve that. And most importantly, some of the more popular rides, just like every year, and, you know, unfortunately, we can't uh, prevent this, but required maintenance throughout the weekend. Thankfully, they were able to get the rides back up and going, unlike prior years. Um, it's certainly, uh, never a good thing when one of the more popular adult rides out of the small selection that they're bringing is broken for the entire weekend and, uh, folks are demanding refunds. Food vendors, same idea. So there's various fan favorites, Doughboys, French fries, lemonade. Um, but some issues here, most of the food vendors did not accept credit cards and the midway provider also did not bring an ATM for folks to use. So. Folks were constantly going to the building ATMs. And when that many people are going to use the building ATMs, they then run out of money. And um, during the weekend, they certainly aren't going to come and fill them up. So that's one of the focuses for us, lack variety of foods. Um, and then some of the stands were too close to each other, causing the lines to bottleneck, causing confusion on where people were supposed to go and how the midway is designed. Independent midway. Um, 
so local live music, we had our in-house entertainment tent. We hosted six local bands, um, Midway Entertainment in terms of attractions, Party Paluga, Silver Circus, Showtime Steve, North Atlantic Wrestling, which was heavily attended in the antique car show on that following or the, the final Sunday. Um, this is an increase in what we did the previous year, but certainly not where we want to be. Independent vendors from the vendors we control, the vendors we book, um, sponsors, advertisers, um, 15 vendors, three sponsor booths, four uh, independent food trucks. And then we did some uh, fan favorite food eating contests. Um, whoopie pies, hot dogs, hot wings, ice cream, and blueberry pie. I think the same guy won like three out of the five. So, um, agriculture, this one is a huge return for us. Um, working with some of our other OVG facilities, um, one in particular in North Carolina, they have a, a similar building, similar footprint. Um, their fair is in a parking lot. They utilize their venue for agriculture, and that's kind of where this idea came from. So out of the pandemic, it was always, how are we going to return agriculture? And um, as many folks know, it at one point was, I believe, the second longest running agriculture fair in the States um, behind, I think, Skowhegan. And the idea was always, how do we get them back? And we spent countless days, countless hours trying to figure out, can we put them in tents? Can we use the paddock? Can we use X, Y, or Z? Do we just figure out how to build new barns? Do we do this? Do we do that? And then we work with our OVG partners and landed on the arena. And it was, um, a lot of folks were confused at how it was going to work. Um, the consensus after the fact is that it worked and they're looking forward to the future. A lot of folks um, have been calling our livestock superintendent day in, day out. How can we get involved? How can we get there? What's it going to look like next year? So on and so forth. Um, we saw the return of beef and dairy cattle, goats, sheep, and old McDonald's farm. The 4-H market auction saw record pricing, which is important to note because now a lot of folks are looking to bring their animals to our fair, right? So that's our growth. That's how we get from where we are this year to bigger attendance in the ag world, um, using a wider footprint, using space in our convention center, not for animals, but for um, you know, one-off shows, um, you know, that sort of stuff that you know, we can use that ancillary space for meetings and you know, all of that good stuff. So they saw approximately ninety-three thousand dollars total in the market auction. So I think so OVG support. So during this process, we worked with Doug, um, the senior vice president, and some of the other folks that have, um, you know, can either be considered fair experts or um, run fairs at their individual properties. Uh, one of the big ones, Scott Shacklett. He's uh, the manager of the LA County Fair. And then Claudio, we worked with him a couple of different phone calls and Seth Bennell, um, general manager of Crown Complex, um, which is the North Carolina Fair that's very similar to our footprint and what we are looking to establish. <coughs> One of the conversations we had with Seth very early on was taking ownership of your midway is the only way that your fair is going to become your fair and better again, right? So how can we grow it? It's taking ownership. If we continue to let it be what it is, it's going to remain. It's never going to get better. And we can say year in and year out that we want to grow, we want to be better. But until we do things like that, until we have more oversight, until we hold our partners accountable for doing what they say they're going to provide, it's going to remain what it is. So. Our future recommendations, the goal is to strengthen the Bangor State Fair by reestablishing its importance to the greater Bangor community. Um, drive local engagement, capture a broader demographic through offering a larger variety of attractions and taking creative approaches to expanding our existing revenue streams, such as our food and beverage world and having more oversight there. 
Midway, you know, ultimately the goal is to partner with a new Midway provider. So many folks know that we used to have Fiesta shows. Fiesta mm -hmm. shows prior to the pandemic was the Midway provider. After the pandemic, they outsourced a lot of their stuff to Smokey's Greater Shows. This prior year, we worked exclusively with Smokey's Greater Shows. Um, we have a meeting in two weeks with Maine Agriculture Fairs, Maine, yeah, that. Um, and there's a, a company that wants to get into the state of Maine from a midway standpoint. So um, they're looking at other state of Maine fairs and how they can get involved, how they can be present. Um, so our goal here is to take ownership of our midway. Um, and it starts now, it starts with this conversation. Independent midway, you know, we want to provide more additional attractions. We want to increase the number of independent vendors. We want to um, utilize our space more deliberately to encourage folks to go to the building um, from the midway and, and extend it, create a bigger footprint, um, utilize our parking lots, lot A and lot B, instead of just lot C for the midway, extend beyond the grandstands um, to get people involved back there. So um, it's aggressive, but our goal is expansion. Our goal is a bigger footprint, provide more options, provide a better um, event for anybody that's interested in going to the fair. Grandstand entertainment, this is our big draw. Um, this past year, we had the truck pulls, we saw the return of tractor pulls, we had a country concert, and we had the demotion derby. We wanna do all of that, and we wanna do more monster trucks, motocross, more racing events, there's conversations that possibly doing some sort of um, exhibition horse racing prior to the fair getting underway, prior to any of the steel being on the track or mm -hmm. the cars messing up the track or parking in the infield. So um, we're hopeful that those conversations continue to um, expand and, and we can make something like that happen. Other attractions, more local and regional live entertainment, offering an additional acoustic soundstage um, community driven events, touch a truck, um, or a similar style event. Um, how can we utilize things like the grandstand prior to a country concert going or prior to the demotion derby? So really thinking about it from a standpoint of usage, instead of just letting it kind of sit and waiting for the next act to happen at the next night. So one of the goals here is to is to look at other fairs. Um, a few of us are going to go to Freiburg. A few of us are going to go to the Big E. A few of us are going to go to Topsfield and really seeing how they utilize their space and what they have for attractions that are going on during um, each individual day. <laughs> Agriculture, um, the goal here is, is just expansion. How can we be bigger than we were last year, offering more commodities, offering more usage, expanding um, some of the footprint to outdoors, um, more demonstrations, um, increase the number of existing, you know, uh, exhibitors, um, creating an opportunity for our folks to, to be involved. So, um, we want to bring a grain style, um, exhibitor hall with vegetables, baked goods, that sort of stuff. And really trying to get that included in the the overall footprint of what we have going on in the building. Obviously, everybody knows it's a huge space. So if we can use the space, we certainly want to. Food and beverage oversight. Um, right now, we're kind of out in the, uh, the cold when it comes to the actual food that's offered during the fair. We provide internally the food and beverage tent that's in-house. So um, what that means is we have no say on who comes. We have no say on how many options they have. If Smokies wants to have one doughboy stand, they're going to have one doughboy stand. And then that creates um, the line issues and um, people waiting in line for a doughboy for 45 minutes. So we want to have more oversight. We want to provide more options. Um, we want to we want to highlight our uh, ability to get creative with our internal food and beverage menus. Uh, we want to use social media to help sell that space. Um, more signage that points people not only to our food and beverage tents, but also additional offerings that we have, taste testings, um, and our ability to add additional 21 plus spaces for um, adults to indulge. Growth and support. So how we're going to get here is 
subcommittees. Um, we want to create an opportunity for not only our uh, venue staff to be involved and in helping lead the directions of some of these areas like grandstand events and midway local entertainment, but also the community. Um, we want to invite folks to be involved with the direction. What do they want to see? How do they want to see it happen? Um, we have several committees, uh, subcommittees that we're hopeful for. Um, and I'm sure as we continue throughout the next year with planning, more will pop up. And our support comes with o OFU Group and Association of Agriculture Affairs and our CSC Advisory Board. And the last bit, so our goal is to have two weekends um, in 2024. So reason number one is, um, unfortunately, we can't predict the weather. And having one of your four days completely rained out, which is one of your more important nights, um, becomes a challenge from a financial standpoint. So our goal is to grow. Our goal is to have four days with Midway and agriculture starting on Thursday, going through Sunday, off Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for resets of um, staffing in our Midway. Um, agriculture can certainly operate if they are so inclined. Um, and then opening back up from every standpoint on Thursday going through Saturday. Um, the goal is to be 12 to 10 um, later on weekends. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's at the end of the day, I mean, for us, you know, the ability for us to be successful um, comes with our ability to have multiple weekends, doing multiple demolition derbies, multiple concerts bringing back truck pulls, which was a draw, bringing back tractor pulls, which was a draw. So having the ability to have multiple weekends is important for our growth. We're excited about the future of the fair. I, mean, I really, I think um, it, it, we can get it back to a point that the entire community is proud to be, to, that it's a real fair. And I think over the years, it's become a fair that turned into a carnival. And then now I think that we've really got the, the framework in place and the, the building box in place to build us back to do to a true community bang or state fair. Questions, comments, Councilor Trumbull? I think people are very happy to see the agriculture aspect back this year. I know we were creative and made that work. Um, and the report was great. I was actually shocked to see when you looked at 2017 to 2019, how the, it had dropped before the pandemic and we have a 10 day fair. Our revenue and attendance is for a four day fair, it isn't really that off from 2019. So it's, it was pretty amazing. And I think in the past, if we made $50,000 on the fair, we were very pleased with that. I think this year when we were at $70,000. So that's very impressive for a four day event. My question, my question is right, right here. If you've got everything set up, um, what's the uh, advantage to not having? The midway on those Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You probably get yeah. set up. Why, why would you? So historically, historically on those um, first few days of the week, we see very low attendance in general, right. and staffing still exists, right? So um, our staffing expenses significantly outweigh the revenue. We so even if, it's, even if it's not run by mid Fiesta right. or, yep. or Smoky, yeah, because we still have our internal staffing, right. but they right. also still have yeah. their, you know their hourly or contracted workers that they have to pay. So, so it allows them to reset those wages. So right now, like Smokies does, all the, they just control who the food vendors mm -hmm. are. And, mm -hmm. and who is Smokies still? Is that still the Gilmore's? Do you know well, for uh, it's, it's owned by Jeanette. Oh, some other girl. Jeanette like Gilmore. Yeah. Is still the yeah. Bloods, Bloods, the Bloods, Bloods, family. The, yeah, the Bud's wife. Girl. Yeah, and then um, EJ Teen. The, yeah. the Dean still owned Fiesta. Right. So he stepped out this past year. The only um, the only involvement that Fiesta shows had with the Bangor State Fair this year is the ride key. Okay. Um, and that's one of the things that full transparency, we don't want to go backwards with. Um, I think going back to the old steel booth with hard tickets is a mistake. So we need to stay um, in this century with technology and continuing to grow that aspect. And that's truthfully one of our concerns is whoever we go with, we need to be um, mindful that they might not have that ride key off. So we still may need to outsource to a Fiesta shows, rent it from them or buy it from them for the weekend, whatever it might be. So, Thanks. 
I would comment that I think this is all very positive suggestions. The Bangor State Fair has always been very important to me. Where I went on the first date with my wife, it was great, but it was a long time ago. And what happened from a long time ago until now was a very significant degradation of the fair. I think it's Doug said it went from fair to carnival. And if these things weren't in progress or under discussion or as prospects for the future, I would be disinclined to continue with them because I think it has gotten such a poor representation of the community. I think you're on track to make it better mm -hmm. and, and you get some time to do that. But if we don't achieve some of these things, it's not worthwhile just holding a glorified carnival and, and putting in the amount of effort. I would comment on the effort just a little bit. I think you mentioned it, but I would emphasize what I, one of my takeaways is that it is imperative that you take control of everything. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is our fair and we're in charge and everybody else does what we want them to do rather than them telling us what they want to do. And if uh, I think that's you know, just critical to being able to be successful. I, uh, so, and I'm confident that you can take that control. But if we don't, we're not going to have these results. I think council ought to back you up and mm -hmm. taking whatever control you need to. Yeah. I would mention one thing that is a, uh, just kind of for a discussion between you, the council, and Hollywood casinos is one of the things we identified while talking with them is that the oval inside the racetrack is currently significantly underutilized. It used to be utilized for recreational purposes. There were baseball fields, there were tennis courts, there were portions. There were a lot of things that happened there. And it could be better utilized again. We could probably put five soccer fields in the infield or a baseball field or a couple of soccer fields, but that would mitigate against parking, mm -hmm. um, depending on how that was set up. So an investment in improving the recreational quality of that space would not go along with tearing it up with a lot of parking. So it's just a, a issue for discussion because I don't think, to me, I would rather have year-round recreational space than seven days worth of parking. <clears throat> but I think that's just a point for mm -hmm. consideration and some subsequent discussions. We think you can use the space not only for parking, but for festivals. And so that's mm -hmm. the conversation we've been having is to do other events and, you know, mm -hmm. on the grass there, you know, outside of the fair. There's, I think there's a, a tremendous potential there, which is underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, I, I'd like to see it mm -hmm. come back. Yeah. Okay. Do you think with this new format that Fiesta would consider coming back? Mm -hmm. I think they would consider, yes. I think the challenge will always have um, really with anybody is trucking fees. So mm -hmm. the biggest reason why they got out of Austin, they're not the Skowhegan anymore, is trucking up here for four mm -hmm. days just to move it there for 10 days and then they're out of the state. So mm -hmm. um and they can they can make more money in a four day carnival or a fair where they're located yeah. in New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. sure. But I think more days it certainly yeah. gives us the ability to push for for better in terms of a midway provider and what we can request from them, what they can offer to us. Um, one of the things we run into is looking at our uh, ride setup, we had less rides in Skowhegan and it's the same midway provider. And the reason being is it's cheaper for them to truck it mm -hmm. 45 minutes less plus backtracking. So I think that's part of our conversations is working with our folks, asking what they can offer for a setup like this and actually making a reasonable decision based off of that instead of what's always been available to us. And you have that new one that you're going to move with. Yeah. <laughs> the thing about the Esther was when they came in, the quality of their rides, 
the appearance of their rides. Everything was shiny. They had a lot of new rides that they would bring in. And yes, it did cost them money, but they brought it. Mm -hmm. And then as numbers went down, it made it tough for them to justify coming here. Right. So, but right. they like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? I was just going to say, I really like the direction you're mm -hmm. taking the fair. Um, I think that needs to happen. So, mm -hmm. good luck and for your picture of it. Appreciate <laughs> it. And thank you very much for the annual report. That was thank very you. enlightening. Um, looks like thank you on the yeah, we're... yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. And it, it was a nice event yesterday. Uh, had a nice little turnout. Um, so that was really good. So, 10 years down, another 10 years to go. <laughs> Perfect. You're good. Nice. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Next up, um, American Rescue Plan. I'm going to say I feel very out of sorts sitting on this side. We can move over now. I get it. <laughs> I think I have to. I don't want to move that. So um, I just wanted to, there were had been a number of items um, that the council had uh, suggested that we look, that we suggest we could look at using um, an alternate funding. Uh, so the Bangor Area Homeless Shelter had two um, applications, one for diversion, one for warming center. Um, our Community development officers looked at that. Both of those will qualify for funding under C to BG. Uh, Bangor Halfway House, the facility improvement, the cabinets. Again, um, community development officer looked at that. These are something we can accomplish here. Uh, the Together Place Peer Run Recovery. Uh, they also had about $53,000 worth of um, facility improvements, a lot of them accessibility type issues. Again, those will qualify for CDBG funding, um, and that CDBG officer is actually working with these recipients. So I just wanted to close the loop on that. Okay. I did include in here the update on the funding. Um, obviously, we have, uh, I believe, six applications or seven applications that we have yet to, to finalize, but the numbers that have been requested are still reflected in here. Um, so uh, to date, we've awarded uh, $12.7 million worth of funding. Um, we are still looking at $8 million in the applications, which you know gives us sort of about $122,000 um, of funds that would be available for the council to consider doing something else with at some other point in time. So I think we've been wholly focused on trying to get through the applications we have before we go back and revisit what our mm -hmm. next steps may be. Because frankly, until we get through the applications, it may dictate what we do have. So update on prior items. Uh, together place housing. Um, the original application had come in to acquire and renovate a multi-unit building. Um, the original um, request was that it be um, through Together Place Housing Inc., which was a taxable entity. Um, the board has confirmed that they would like to update the applicant name from Together Place Housing Inc. to Friends of Together Place, a nonprofit. But for clarity, what happens is, is the nonprofit acquires the property and then they hold title to the land and they immediately transfer the building over to the for profit entity. And then they lease the land under it back to the for profit for a period of about 99 years. So there had been some concerns before about for-profit entities. So I think we could probably look at some similar deed issues and mm -hmm. allow that. We sort of crossed that hurdle with another taxable entity. So I didn't know if there was any thought so on that. The, the for-profit entity is going to be operating the house? Yes, and they will yeah. own it. The for-profit will acquire right. it. And then the for, I'm sorry, the non-profit acquires it. And then they transfer building to the for-profit yes. entity, okay. who then acts as a co-op. Mm -hmm. So the building itself would be in the name of a for-profit right. entity after the initial acquisition. Mm -hmm. The land remains yeah. in the name of the non-profit with a long-term lease attached to it. So we're waiting for that to come? Nope, that's the new information. Okay. Right. Originally, it was a directly to the nonprofit. Right. Yeah. And then I got a further clarification just before I walked in the meeting about how 
the building is acquired for, by the nonprofit and then transferred for the to the for profit. But I think we've crossed that hurdle for how to address for profit concerns. Questions, comments? Where do you want to go? So are we at the point of making a motion on some of the Yep. I would I would move passage. I would move supporting this project in full. It's some more than that. Three seven three hundred and seventy-five thousand. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Uh questions, comments. I just have a question, please. So this is a full uh, voting for full amount, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So my question is, is there an acquisition cost of this or is it just, are we talking just renovation? So the, the acqui part of this will go towards acqu acquisition and renovation and the two entities, both the nonprofit and the for-profit will be putting funds towards completing the project as well. They've each got the ability to con contribute up to a $69,000 to help make this project come to fruition. But it's not an acquisition of a of a property yeah. or a building here. It could be, yes. It That's what be. they're going to look for, yes. I think they would rather look for a an existing building, multi-unit, acquire it, renovate it to right. their needs. All right. I was just confused. With, nope, sorry. With the, they already have one. And That's what I was thinking. That they, oh, they operate a company, yes. Yeah. Okay. But this proposal is not based on an identified property. This right. is give us the money so we could go shopping. Yes. Okay. In Bangor. Yeah, right. Um, I, I would, I'm uncomfortable with that level of specificity of just saying, gee, give us the money and we're gonna go and find some building somewhere that we can renovate and operate. Uh, that seems very open. Can we request maybe to be conditional uh, to the to come back to us when they decide on the place or the building? So I if, I would not envision us issuing a check until they have identified right. a location. Sure. Um, and certainly we can have a come back and have a discussion when they got a full plan. I mean, in the other direction, we could give a time limit on this, you know, like nine to the end of the year or 90 days or something like that. If they don't find a location in a certain amount of time, we'll do something else with it. I mean, does the end of the year sound reasonable? Uh, so, when do these funds to need to be spent by, uh, so the, the, funds do, the funds need to be committed by December 31st of 2024. And expended by December 31st of 2026. Huh. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I, I support doing the fully funding tonight. Um, I, I understand sort of what Council Trumbull is saying with the time limit, but just given the market and what's available and all those things, I wouldn't feel comfortable putting that restriction on it. Um, and just to go back to what Debbie had brought up early on about looking at doing sort of the same kind of contractor work with them that we're looking at with other for-profit, I would support that as well. Okay, um, I thought what would be, what would be a um, reasonable time frame to, to allow them to, to look for a property. This is what, like, is it is it so hard that it's gonna take that long or it can be done within a short frame of time? I mean, I think that's a question of what's sitting on the market today and what could right. be on the market tomorrow and what could be on the market a month. As far as I'm now. concerned, I, if we give them a year to look for something, <clears throat> it's, it's, we would still have October, November, December in order mm -hmm. to, to commit, help, for, a to commit it for a different purpose. So, I, you know, is, is a year enough or is it too much? Nine months? I'm just throwing it Do out. Do you want there. me to amend my? Or we, can we just make, yeah. I think I think a year would be the question. Right. Councilor Davitt. Thanks. I guess I'm wondering what the full goal of setting a time limit is. As in, like, are we afraid they're just going to sit on the money and not find something? I mean, I think that's their their goal, and I can't imagine them necessarily dragging 
their feet. I mean, if the majority supports a time limit, like, but I just, I don't fully understand why, why that we're concerned with that. I, I guess I was kind of thinking, <clears throat> I do want to put a time limit on it just because um, if they don't find a place, I don't want us losing out on the opportunity to give that to another organization or another entity or something that the city may or may not want to be using that money for. So I, that's why I was kind of preferring put a time limit on it because if they can't find something, I want to be able to make sure that we have enough time to allocate it out. Councilor Trumbull? I agree with that. I think everything we funded is either been a specific project or they've had something they're going to spend it on. I think this is unique where they, they got to go find a property. So I think maybe three months is too short, but a year is definitely enough time. And then, like you said, if not, we've got to have these funds encumbered by the end of you know 2024. So I think this is very reasonable, put a year. So I don't think it's going to be an issue. I think they'll find something within yeah. the next yeah. four or five yeah. months, but yeah. just in the event they don't, we can we'll have access to that line. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I would amend my motion to say that we would fund this in the full amount of $375,000 and that they have a year to find a property for us to release the funds. And with similar provisions as other non- And other with similar profits. provisions as other for non-profit, for-profits. For <laughs> Previous second stands for the <laughs> so We have a motion, we have a second. Any other comments? If not, as usual, we'll do a roll call vote. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Sprague? No. Councilor Tremble? Yes. Councilor Schaefer? Yes. Councilor Hawes? Yes. Councilor Yacobaga? Yes. Councilor Davitt? Yes. I will be a yes as well. Thank you. St. Andre's home. St. Andre's home. Um, so it really wasn't clear in their initial, just to remind folks, they'd requested $50,000 on the personnel cost to support their courage lives work. Um, it wasn't clear from the budget that they submitted what the intent was. Um, so we did provide the background information uh, they provide community-based enhanced behavioral health care and related support service for anyone impacted by human trafficking, exploitation, and domestic and sexual violence. Um, their um, $50,000 request for one-time funds through the city of Bangalore to support the following of their program. They are looking to hire a, a full-time mental health clinician to serve at least 50 people annually, as well as a full-time case manager, uh, deliver at least 20 educational groups to the community over the next year, and expand uh, their empowerment pantry. They did have an update on other fundraising requests or in process. To date, they have secured the $160,000 of additional funds from other grantors um, that they had anticipated in um, their initial application. Um, and I think what we were looking at is when we were looking at their financial information, uh, their expenses are always greater than their revenues for an entity as a whole outside. And most of the, a lot of their work is in this work courage live area. Um, they do have a relationship um, with the, I'm not going to get the acronym right. So I'm just going to call it the SCIM Foundation. It's committed to supporting the work of St. Andre Home and its flagship program of Courage Lives. The foundation covers any gaps in funding. Uh, in addition, many of the services provided by the two new physicians will be able to be built through insurance as far as it relates to sustainability. The financial statements do state the operations are non-sectarian, but they do operate under the direct general direction of a religious order. Um, the question was, how does that impact your day-to-day -day operations? Uh, St. Andrew's Home is a private nonprofit organization started by the Good Shepherd Sisters uh, to meet the needs of vulnerable women and children in Maine. Um, their work does inform their mission. Uh, while their dedication to promoting human dignity is part of all that we do, the Good Shepherd Sisters are not directly involved in the day-to-day -day operation of Courage Lives. Um, and Courage Lives count, uh, clients uh, receive services regardless of nationality, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or ability to pay. That's one paper. My, my question is really a, a numbers one and how $50,000 is going to support all four of those goals because so they raise the other 160. This is like a one, this is like a 25% request to get it off the ground in the first year. They have raised the balance of the funds to fund the work. Okay. And, they, and the sustainability portion comes in as they anticipate they're going to be able to build insurance for 
some of the services mm -hmm. that they provide. And that wasn't wholly clear in that first application that we got. Yeah. Any other questions, Dr. Chilton? On this one, I mean, having that information, because because you know, looking at one through four, I was thinking even $50,000 and so kind of similar to what we did for uh, Eastern Area Agency on mm -hmm. Aging with providing meals. So, you know, I am not supportive of like operating costs, but if it's a startup cost that they can see, you know, sustainability and being able to keep it going after our chunk, I would support this. Um, and and Is that a motion? I would move that we fully fund this fifty thousand dollars. Second, great. Yeah, I would say. Um, yeah, second. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> Seeing none, uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Councilor Pelletier. Yes. Councilor Spark. Yes. Councilor Trumbull. Yes. Councilor Schaefer. Yes. Councilor Hogg. Yes. Councilor Yakabaga. Yes. Councilor Davitt. Yes. I will be a yes as well. I will pass unanimously. All right. We go. Next up, uh, Penquist Cat. Yes. Um, so um, just to refresh folks' memory, um, this is a request for $1.5 million for the acquisition and construction of the Small Development Center, which would consolidate. It says four locations, but it's likely three locations because it's likely they would continue to maintain their site at Eastern Maine Community College. Uh, there was a concern raised that the project adds only 18 child care slots. Um, you know, the response from Penquist is that uh, this allows um, Penquist to actually retain nearly $3 million of federal funding for the project. If they are unable to bring uh, funding for this project, $3 million will have to be returned to the Office of Head Start and the opportunity to provide an early child Edu early education and child care hub for Bangle will be lost. Um, ARPA will help preserve existing slots um, while also adding the notice. Scheme. Um, this um, service of facility would also does not only Head Start three to five year old, but early Head Start six weeks to three years old. Head Starts have been funded, flat funded for years, increasing cost staffing um, have forced um, cuts to the number of slots that they operate. And once slots are removed from our award, we're unable to get them back. Um, the funding from Head Start is meant to cover staffing, building costs, and administrative supplies. Uh, they currently lease most of their locations, all of their Bangor locations anyway. Their largest one serving 80 children is on Davis Road. It was a lease from Bangor Housing Authority. It started, it was for decades, very uh, low at $6,000 a year. It has now increased to nearly $88,000 a year. It's an increase that they cannot sustain. Um, for a housing authority, they are seeing the same kinds of increase. Again, um, they, they relate to the fact that Head Start program is flat funding. Um, Venture Way is kind of a challenge. The, the bus can't get up there. It requires children to walk up and the hill. On safe weather conditions, they have uh, experienced occasional break-ins. Um, they also um, have had to address some security systems. Obviously, they have to make sure that they are clearing the grounds for needles and drug paraphernalia throughout book and children are let out. The three at Eastern Maine uh, Community College uh, are not designated just for the students. It's their affiliation with the schools to serve as a lab school for their students who need teaching experience. Um, available for many years, available uh, private pay child care slots at that location have been filled by the children of hospital staff. Um, it was discussed whether or not they could raise fee. They actually can't uh, because they participate in the state's child care subsidy program that assists low to moderate income families. Um, as a participant, they cannot charge more than the market rate is determined by a state survey um, of providers. The last survey was completed in 2021. Um, or let's say Penquist can charge no more than 255 a week for infants, 230 a week for toddlers, and 205 a week for preschoolers. Um, Head Start funding comes with helps offset the cost, does come with stringent guidelines to ensure high quality um, early childhood education. Other teachers have to have a bachelor's degree, and those working with infants and toddlers must, of course, work focused on that age group. Um, talks about the additional services, the development, health screening, and foods um, that are provided to children in the Head Start. Uh, they are required to follow evidence-based curriculum. Um, 
day actually went to the to or we talked about could venture way be a private child care if Peg was vacated that building. Uh, they actually took some time to consider that their, uh, the viability of remaining at that location and offering infant and toddler care separate from Head Start. They could maintain many of the practices that contribute to high quality, but they wouldn't be uh, would not be obligated to that Head Start or the main subsidy program. Uh, licensing allows eight infants and toddlers per class with minimum staffing would dictate two staff per per eight babies. Enquist would actually want to use three. Um, revenue using a similar rate to a nearby child care, child care center where infant and toddler is four fifty a week um, times eight children for fifty two weeks one hundred eighty seven thousand dollars of revenue versus their staffing expenses, which was about two twenty six. Uh, the question is too as schools transition to full pre -day, pre full day pre K um, and what that impact would have pre K uh, programs is, serves eligible four year olds. Families with three-year-olds still require care and education. Our current wait list for Bangor families is 28 Head Start and 44 Early Head Start. Um, how many students aren't enrolled in their choice location? They make every effort um, to enroll children in the center that parents prefer, but at times aren't able to accommodate that request. Um, we have an opening for a pre preschool child at one location, but no room for the sibling that requires infant and toddler. There are typically a few families in this situation each year with the new building, we would be able to keep siblings at the same location, minimizing transportation and time stress in families. Uh, transportation barrier for individuals. Uh, they shared that they had three families that walked their children to the Davis Road location. Most families have transportation or access to transportation to bring their children to the centers. Last year, 22 of the 80 children um, served at the Davis Road uh, location in Cape Verde. Looking ahead, there is the potential that will separate funding to consider busing to a central um, center location. Has not been viable in the past due to scattered uh, childcare sites. Um, they have provided a pro forma um, that includes sort of the operating uh, revenue projections and operating costs for a new facility. I do believe it anticipates um, the um, total funding from the ARPA allocation because it still represents a balanced budget. Um, they also had state that if they are um, successful, that the Office of Head Start would mandate that we, they convene a policy council with parent and caregiver representation for each of their um, early childhood locations. Group is responsible for considering and approving both our grant and any substantial changes in programming locations which would be required as part of any potential consolidation. And um, without the city's offer funding, um, they state that they will be forced to cut slots in order to cover increasing expenses. Questions, comments? <laughs> Councilor Schaefer? Um, <clears throat> a lot of this information really helps clarify things, especially seeing that early Head Start can be used for infant and toddler care as well. And it's not just necessarily 16 preschoolers seeing the um, lease rates was really eye-opening. And then also even the part of saying, what if they ran a commercial daycare out of the existing place? I mean, it's not news to me, but it might be news to other people who are not familiar with how even regu you know, regular private plain old daycare works and that your revenue will never meet your expenses, especially when you're talking about infant care. So um, just, there's a lot, there's been a lot of discussion with that just in the, in the last couple of weeks. Um, so having this information uh, is very helpful. And it sounds like if they had their own facility, it would save them at least $100,000 a year in, in leases. Um, and if they ever left it, a child care center would have, there'd be a need for it. So I am now inclined to support this. Mm -hmm. trouble. What, what's the thing is where is this located? Uh, I I believe that the site they're looking at is um, adjacent to um, the Hannaford on Broadway. Okay, yeah. I guess we did talk about. Yeah, yeah. Again, I think this is a good project. I just not sure of full funding. I mean, when you look at what we we've, we've done, some other funding for uh, child care or child care stuff. I mean, you look at. Uh, I think we allocated two million for the Y. And that $2 million, you look at the Y funding, covers a lot more than child care, covers from child 
early childhood, right up to the oldest people in the community, and had much, I think, a much bigger impact for $2 million. And when you look at this for 1.5, it's very helpful, but I'm not sure that it equates. I mean, I think you should look at what we funded in the past, and I, I could see maybe get a 500,000 or so, but 1.5 seems like an awful lot for when you look at other things funded like this. Councilor Pelletier. Thank you. I think it's worth noting that the total budget for the Y is in the ballpark of $50 million. The total budget for this project, I think, is mm -hmm. four and a half. So, right. So, we percentage wise, that's what I'm saying. Percentage wise, it's a lot higher on this one than the other ones. Mm -hmm. Councilor Yakabaga. I think while I agree with Councilor Trimble's point, I also want to think about what will happen if we don't fully fund this project. I feel the consequences of not fully funding it, the impact on struggling families, especially, I mean, talking about Head Start, the number of people on the waiting list for uh, pre-K or like babies, uh, I think that the impact will be really rough. But I, I hear you, Councilor Trimble, that's exactly what went through my mind as I was reading the numbers. Uh, it's, it's a tough one to decide on like full, um, uh supporting this fall or partial i feel partial will be will affect the the outcome uh, it's a sort of one here Councilor Frick. It, it, learning this additional information is very helpful it does seem to me that we're being positioned that if we don't fund this, it means that the Head Start program in Bangor is going to fall apart. That they won't have a facility, they won't be able to manage their expenses, they won't be able to continue their operations, they'll be have to cut uh, the services that they provide. And I, I may be misinterpreting that, but it, it doesn't feel good that we're being positioned. So in saying, well, if you don't give us the ARPA funds, uh, this whole venture and thus the Head Start program is going to be at serious jeopardy. I don't, I believe that there is some risk, but I don't believe it falls apart based on our funding. Um, the, so that, that doesn't strike me quite right. Uh, I'm also interested in what Bangor Housing's position is on this proposal. Uh, given that many of the kids that are uh, needing Head Start services are located in Bangor housing facilities. Uh, and it seems that they've, uh, in the past, taken an approach that they, you know, care deeply about the welfare of the people who live in their facilities and supporting the boys and girls clubs and a variety of other programs. And in this case, it uh, seems that um, they have, uh, a, increase the least cost to such an extent that it puts the program at risk. And I'm interested in why that has occurred and what Bangor Housing feels is an appropriate alternative to providing long-term sustainability for the Head Start program, other than the city just underwriting it with our funds. So I, am, I, I don't have a good feel for this yet. Um, although I believe that there's a considerable merit in maintaining the Head Start program. I think it's essential to the community. But I don't think we've got a full package of facts and alternatives before us. Thank you. Councilor David. Um, thank you. Um, I'm actually, well, I'll make my comment first, but um, just to Councilor Sprague's last point, I mean, um, seeing as Bangor Housing is their landlord, I'm sure that they're going to have feelings about it that may vary from what, not to say what would be best, but um, they're, the, they're the ones who'd be losing out <laughs> on the lease. So I'm sure that that comes with its own perspective. Um, but I won't go down into all the, the reasons, but um, I, do, I think this is an incredibly worthy project. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that when we've talked over time in all the years we were talking about spending this money was how do we invest in really big projects that are going to be here for a long time? This is one of those um, that has an immediate impact as soon as that can start building the cost things that Councilor Schaefer spoke about. So um, I would move that we fully fund um, the Penquist ask. 
Any other comments? I just Councilor want to follow up on Councilor Sprague's comments. I, I agree. I mean, I feel like, but for full funding, this Head Start is going to disappear in Bangor is, is not accurate at all. The Head Start's been in Bangor since then for 55 years. It was one of the first programs that CAP agencies did. It was part of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society Plan. It's just, Head Start's not going to go away if we don't fully fund this request. So that's just ridiculous concept to even consider. So that's all. I, I support this, but one not at 1.5 million. Having all this updated information has been very helpful to me. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm i not in support of fully funding this. In my mind, I, I was looking at maybe 750 at a cap of maybe up to a million, um, but um, I'm not comfortable with the, that full, full amount. Where do you want to go? Uh, Councilor Shaker. I believe Councilor Davitt made a mo motion mm -hmm. to authorize full funding. My my question is, ha have we other agencies we've asked, mm -hmm. what could you do with partial funding? Is partial funding, and kind of we talked about, will it happen with or without it? So have we gotten that answer from them? I didn't see it in the notes. I think we did. I'm looking. There's a lot of information. I just saw the um, the seven percent borrowing rate um, over ten years, um, mm -hmm. and that puts that was what's in their budget. I don't know what the mm -hmm. what that figure is, what they were borrowing it at. So they were they're contributing. So the overall project budget is about seven point five million dollars. There's three million something from remaining in their Head Start grant that they anticipate. Uh, they are using, I believe it was 1.5 million of their own funds, and they were borrowing through a commercial loan, 1.5 million. I believe the overall project budget is somewhere in the neighborhood of 7.5 million. Councilor Yakabaga. I mean, if if it takes uh, maybe partially funding this project to be approved, I would go with that, but I would not go with less than a million. To, to be effective, I feel like 750, it would not do much. Okay, I know there was a there was a motion for fully funded. I have not heard a second. I, I made a second. Oh, you made a second, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Right. We have a motion, we have a second. Councilor Kimball? Oh, I was gonna amend the motion to uh, fund it at $1 million. Is there a second? Do we want to wait to hear back from them if, like, if it's partially funded? What is what, so, what will be affected by this? I I asked the question: Would the project move forward without or with a partial ARPA funding? Without ARPA funding, the private debt would need to be added, making the project cost prohibitive. The city ARPA dollars are essential, and they will assist in leveraging federal dollars. And fill the gap and the pending allocation of federal allocation of um, Head Start funds, which requires a twenty percent local match, which they which they they make anyway with their own equity contribution. Yeah. Councilor Trump, uh, Councilor Frey, yeah, yeah thank you. Um, we have previously had some discussions, although I'm, I'm lacking clarity on the results of uh, offering some money as low interest loans uh, that can be paid back. And if that was a, a use, potential use of the ARPA funds, I'd consider that as an alternative and offering um, maybe a greater loan capacity to be paid back, but at a lower interest rate than the 7% that they're anticipating. Just saying. So I believe the ability to do a revolve, the only time we've had the conversation about a revolving loan fund was specifically related to housing mm -hmm. and um, the eligible activities that you can undertake as it relates to housing continue to broaden under the federal requirements. I have not looked to see if a revolving loan is an eligible use that isn't for housing. Just 
it would seem to me in this particular case that the organization has bargaining capacity and had a lower interest rate, it would be possible to borrow the money and to um, offer and to meet their objectives in terms of the cost of the program. And if they could do that, I'd be inclined to think about something like that uh, without the additional information, such as you know where things stand with Bangor Housing. And I'm left with a feeling that, you know, still left with a feeling that we're being positioned to, you know, if you don't do this, this fails. But I don't believe that that is strictly the case. Councilor Trumbull. Uh, you just brought up a good point. We looked at other projects. We've said, can we use other funding like CDBG? These are obviously low income individuals for uh, Head Start. Can we use CDBG money for part of this? So what we're doing is we're rapidly going through oh, yeah. <laughs> what you have for a, for excess CDBG money. And there's still a couple of other, there may be opportunities, but I, I think we're getting to the point where you may want to consider what you want to do for housing, additional housing opportunities for CDBG versus others. Councilor Schaefer. Uh, you know, childcare was one of our goals. It still is a goal. It is, this is, a capital project in securing a building. Um, if, and it, it, you know, I think Bangor Housing has said what they think about this project and they don't want Head Start there anymore or else they wouldn't have increased their rent $82,000 in less than 10 years. Um, so they don't want them there. And seeing that only 22 students uh, are in Cape Heart that go to Davis Road and only three walk there, Hopefully they can figure out transportation to get to the new center, which is a huge concern of mine in our additional conversation. Uh, I think that we need to find a way to fully fund this, whether it's through a combination of, of our development loan projects, uh, CDBG, ARPA, but at some point we need to find a way to fully fund this because if it's gone up to 88,000 in the last year, then next year it's gonna be 108,000 and then it's gonna be 128,000 and then we're gonna not have child care for and if you read any of the stories about what's happened with the child care center in Caribou, mm -hmm. there, are there are people, mostly women, who are now saying, I can't take that job promotion because the child care closed. And what am I going to do because I'm in Caribou with no child care? I don't want that to be the story in Bangor. Um, early childhood education has a profound impact on future mm -hmm. drug abuse, future, you know, uh, domestic violence. It prevent It's preventative in that way, education attainment, all of those things. So we can sit here very comfortably. I managed to get my kids through daycare and cost more than my mortgage, literally every month costs more than my mortgage. Um, and I managed to do it. I'm very glad that I could, but I also know that it would have been devastating to my own personal career, my own personal future goals if I had not been able to afford childcare. This is about children, but it's also about families. It's about so much more. So we need, I think if, if it's not going to happen without us, and we need to figure out a way to make, put together one and a half million, whether it's a check from the ARPA funds, whether it's a check from the ARPA funds and some sort of low income uh, development loan, whatever. But I think we need to find a way to make this happen. Seeing no other comments, the motion on the table is to fully fund this. Uh, we'll do a roll call. Uh, actually, sorry, was Dan's motion to amend seconded? No. 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 Oh, okay, so that failed. Okay. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> also, we, we have to that vote on the motion on the floor before we could vote right. on anything else. So. Right. No, you can't vote on I mean, if there was an amendment, you have to vote on that. Right. right. But there wasn't. Right. All right. Roll call vote. Councilor Peltier? Yes. Councilor Sprague? No. Councilor Tremble? No. Councilor Schaefer? Yes. Councilor Hawes? Yes. Councilor Yakabaga? Yes. Councilor Devitt? Yes. That would be a no. All right. Bangor right. Children's Home. Did we get an update? Um, no, that's on me. Other so we, things came up today. I I okay. I only imagine. So we'll move on to food and medicine? Yes. All right. Yep. Um, so food and medicine. Um, there was funding request for 261342 to hire a peer workforce navigator for targeted work in Bangor for a three-year period. 
Um, we talked about the fact that a term navigator is widely used and can describe the work undertaken by a physician, you know, by multiple positions. So um, they provided some additional background. Um, they currently have an individual because um, they are serving as a subrecipient of state and federal funds. And they have one peer workforce navigator that provides services to residents that cover seven counties. The position was to uh, came forward initially to approve the resiliency rate with the unemployment benefit system and to guide workers to new jobs, education, and other resources. Um, oftentimes, the navigator is connected with an individual for one barrier, but is able to identify other opportunities as well. Um, they had provided some information during the first quarter of calendar 2023, what the existing navigator did. Um, she had supported 89 individuals. 47% were referred to connect to public benefits, 37% increased income supports, 33% uh, increased food securities, 31% were referred to unemployment, 31% saw increased wages, 25% obtained new employment, 16% received their unemployment benefits, 10% received health care, 8% enrolled in education uh, and training, and 4% gained access to transportation. Uh, the existing grant and uh, that our funding this current position began July 1 of 2022, and the funding is in place through June 30th of 2023. I did ask them to provide a budget. I think if you may recall, the budget included their existing state program, and it was multi-year, so it wasn't really clear um, what it all incorporated. Um, so we did break down um, the total budget in um, your packet. And I'm looking because I know there was some clarification that came in afterwards. Um, so under salaries and benefits, there was a reference that it includes um, supervisory. Um, and they share that this would be additional staff that they would have to hire on top of the navigator position. Um, I also asked, um, yes, this would contribute to the new, same thing for the benefits. Um, all other Melissa. So it, it appears to me that the 14, 14,426 under rent and utilities um, may be indirect cost um, original budget. So we had some folks who were on vacation and some folks who were out some were some other things. Um, so but about um, 16,000 also seems to include supervisory. I do think that um, the council wants to consider whether or not you, we really have not done indirect costs. Um, indirect costs are certainly an eligible use under federal grants, but we have stayed far away from that. Um, and I know Penobscot County has embraced that and offered that up every participant, but I don't think the council has done that to this date. So I think we'd need some clarification on what exactly, but it appears that it is one person and is and part of another person as it relates to supervisor as well as some indirect costs. Uh, they have made um, some funding solutions, but not to actually fund this position, but to actually augment their ability to deliver effective results. Uh, they see this effort as in initially cost intensive, then decreasing over time. The additional costs beyond the ARPA request are related to uh, developing deep partnerships with organizations in Bangor, developing volunteer leaders within FAM, in integrating this uh, program with other FAM initiatives, including education around root causes and social poverty. And I think there was around uh, up around 50,000 or so that has been raised thus far or identified as a potential to be raised. Um, the sustainability plan appeared to be twofold. Um, if this starts, then there's an opportunity to apply for future state and federal under opportunities um, and to train, not trail, individuals within existing agencies how to uh, assist um, did share that most agencies cited an ability to confirm all their current responsibilities. So, you know, with the creation of a protocol accompanying matters um, that is publicly available be sustainable. Uh, they believe the best way to secure future funding is to demonstrate effectiveness in terms of participant outcomes. The work could be done in conjunction with current state and federal programs, and they believe their members should merit funding. It's about building programs for other organization, which includes training staff members and our volunteers. It's also about building a network capacity with their partners. Um, we plan to develop a training program or protocol. Partner organizations have various missions and success brings capacity. 
Um, the application states funding would allow for additional outreach assistance. If partial funding were awarded, please, des please describe what the program might entail. Uh, they share that they would do uh, the best they can. We believe this needs to take time and skill to develop effective training programs. Good organizations and individuals to participate in the programs along with the organizational skills to develop the network. Questions, comments? So is this for Bangor or for other counties? This was for Bangor. The request for Just was for Bangor. Was for Bangor specific for Bangor. outreach. Yeah. Okay. They have one position that basically works with individuals across seven counties. Uh, yeah, because that's, and I want to make sure yep. that it's just for the Bangor area. Yep. Um, so I'm aware that the Career Center does similar uh, activities, I feel, working. So how, how are we going to avoid duplicating efforts here? So I'm going to say, I think that what food and medicine is looking at is being out and proactively working with individuals and finding opportunities to connect to other services and resources. <laughs> I believe if you go to the community center, you have to initiate that engagement. Um, and they're prepared to answer that question about your particular benefit claim or, or job application. That's a good difference. Okay, thank you. Councilor Trumbull. I was just going to move to fully fund this request. With or without indirect? Uh, without indirect. There's a second. 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 Councilor Fred. I'm still left with the impression on this that this is for a lot of operational funding. There's mm -hmm. some development built into this, but it's basically operational. And I find no credible evidence that it can be sustained uh, other than saying that we'll do a good job and thus people will want to sustain this and provide ongoing funding, which I don't think is a, at all reliable. And then the response that uh, to can you do anything with partial funding, like could you do, you know, with one person and half the funding, the response that we'll do the best we can, I think is insufficient and inadequately addresses uh, what could be done uh, if we were to partially fund this. So I'm not in favor of fully funding it at this amount, given those limitations of what I think we have seen so far. Other comments? Councilor Yakabaga? I kind of disagree sometimes with Councilor Sprague on operational costs specifically, because we always find that uh, Certain nonprofits have proved that even, even if they rely on a grant, they still they do with a good job they do in the community, they are always able to, to keep grants coming and to maintain their operations. So I'm I'm not too worried in that regard. How much was the indirect? I think it's somewhere between it isn't wholly clear, it's somewhere between. 14, 16, or maybe it's in there twice at 30, where okay. we have some folks on vacation. So yep. we're, we're uh, trying to fine. sort through it's that. Yep. One of the clarity as well. Being no other comments, uh, do we have another roll call vote? Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Sprague? No. Councilor Tremble? Yes. Councilor Schaefer? Yes. Councilor Hawes? Yes. Councilor Yakabaga? Yes. Councilor Dabbitt? Yes. This is a hard one. Um, I, sorry, I shouldn't be making a comment yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. And I apologize. I'm just struggling with this because so much of this is operating. And um, anyway, uh, next up. United Way. Oh, United Way. So thank you for the reminder. I'm just going to throw it out there that I do sit on the board of the United Way. Um, they had requested a funding of $800,000 to support the creation of community, a hub, a nonprofit hub to fill important gaps in the nonprofit sector. Um, it is working to increase capacity and infrastructure of multiple organizations. 
Uh, the feedback, the additional questions were, has the congressionally directed spending uh, request advanced? Mm -hmm. uh, it was not included in, in the community appropriations bill. However, it was well received and they will apply again in 25. Mm -hmm. Are of the other funds being sought or committed to date restricted for a particular purpose, i.e. operator and capital? No. Um, the budget submitted with the application appears to include both operating and capital. Please provide additional information regarding the budget um, submitted. Uh, they did provide a revised budget based uh, due to the failure of CDS to delineate, uh, to advance which delineates capital and startup, which encompasses a two year period. So I uh, broke it out that the capital costs are $1.8 million. Uh, the startup operating costs for a period of two years is um, just over $900,000. Um, they have fundraising of $250,000. They've asked the city for 800. They think they intend to ask the county for 800. They've got private nonprofit funding and project fees and sponsorships. To date, they have raised $230,000 of the private funds. At this time, they have not identified potential locations. They can stay and connect with supporters who have many locations and their desire is to remain in Bangor, uh, their home since inception 85 years ago. Uh, was there preliminary fe feasibility work undertaken? Um, conducting a formal feasibility study was not deemed necessary for several reasons. It's a continuation of their Opportunity 2028 framework and extensive community and professional input that serves. Uh, they also have a strong track record of implementing projects in the past, demonstrated the capacity to carry out. Um, they have thoroughly researched and analyzed the current needs and challenges. Um, and one research fact finding and needs assessments um, were not conducted in a vacuum. The consultant consulted key stakeholders, including representatives from each sector, as well as a diverse set of community members. Um, they taking the time for an extensive feasibility study would be a resource intensive and delay our ability to implement this. Um, other operating projections that demonstrate the sustainability of the initiative. And you can see that they have shown um, some fundraising private nonprofit programs, some um, support dress from the United Way sponsorships versus the ongoing operating costs, which seem to show um, that it would operate effectively, provided the money was raised. Seeing none, I take a motion. Go back to questions, comments. <laughs> and I guess I know that folks are getting concerned. And if you don't feel you have adequate time, I would say that we will work to continue this at free committee meeting Monday or Tuesday because I know that you're focused on this and we want to make sure that you have the time. And I know you're all sitting here thinking you have other items. I, I, I still feel like this is sort of amorphous as to what is being offered and what I still don't quite get it. This isn't as clear to me as as other applications. Um, so that that's why I'm mm -hmm. hesitating on it. Mm -hmm. If there was more defined objectives, I'd understand it more. Councilor Trumbull. Yeah, I don't need more time. I mean, I'm sure if we had a no end to the upper funds, I might want to talk about this more. But we're dealing with so many people that have needs for the homeless, uh, the early childhood education. This seems like it's a nice idea, but I'm not inclined to support it with that. Dr. Sprague, I think we do it through and the council reviewed this because the United Way couldn't review themselves. Um, I found a, a lot of merit in what's being proposed in terms of developing a package of services which could strengthen other not-for-profits, could help them do their job better. I'm thinking to myself, gee, for all those projects we didn't fund, maybe it would be great if the United Way could use them as their first clients and help them out. Um, I think that this is a big ask, uh, however, and uh, I would be inclined to 
provide some partial funding for the capital cost, but only that partial funding as not the initial funding, but the complementary funding to other funding that had been raised through other sources. The last dollar coverage, so to speak, rather than the first dollar. But as it's currently structured, I would feel that the the ask is is too great and it's not structured properly. But I'd be willing to defer further discussion on this and come back to it also. Yes, I think I want to second that. Is that a motion? Or if you, or even to come back to discuss this. Yeah. Well, I'm sure. I'd move that we defer final discussion of this item and come back to it and give it some more consideration than we can give it this evening. Second. That's a second. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm not seeing any objections. Can't tell. Roll call. What's that? Is it a motion to a roll, roll call because it's clear? Uh, yes, we will. Uh, Councilor Data? Sorry, I'm, I guess I'm confused on Councilor Sprague's motion. Is it a motion to come back to it after we've allotted everything else? Or I guess what? We need a motion? Like next week. No, I said like move week. to back to it at some time later than tonight for finalizing our discussion. Not that we wait until we find out how much is left over. Does that need a motion? I think he was just trying to bring it to a close. Right. Just clarity. trying to move it along. With clarity. <laughs> okay. Um, I would, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll vote to move it forward. I, but I would say I would, I would agree with Councilor Tremble as far as what we would fund. Um, so unless something magical changes between now and next week, I'll, I'll end up being a no on this. Although I appreciate the work that they do. We're pushing it out to next week, and we do have to do a roll call vote. Yep. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Sprague? Yes. Councilor Trumbull? No. Councilor Schaefer? Yes. Councilor Hawes? Yes. Councilor Yakabaga? Yes. Councilor Davitt? No. I will be a yes. So it's moved out to next week. Okay. All right. Um, I know we have to go into executive sessions. I don't know if we can get to these last two. I will leave that. I mean, we can certainly reschedule these because you do need the time that you need I mean, to I, have I, the discussion that you want to have. I believe. Right. And I, I, think I, I would. I would say let's move this out to next week. And those are, those two items: health equity or heal and uh, lab and active public health. And so. Need a motion on that, or just. With the apologies, I know you all have been waiting for this all night. <laughs> yeah. Can we pay, can we make them at the top of the agenda? Yeah, at the next meeting. So I, I'll look to try to align the committee meetings next week to see if we can okay. do a workshop session first, or maybe we can consolidate meetings again, okay. depending on be, the I depending on the be, length of the agendas. That would be yeah, my preference for yep. These okay. folks waiting here all night. All right. Good. Um, we will do that. Um, next up, uh, manager updates. Real quick, warming centers. Uh, the RFP, when Dan Brennan was here, he talked about there would be an RFP going out for funding of warming centers. That RFP is going to be released on Friday. Uh, the due date will be October 13th, so this should provide more opportunity for sportive operations and for individuals to, uh, to undertake proper planning. We remain on track for the syringe waste contract to roll out uh, October 1st. We'll be working to make sure that all the notifications and that we're all talking the same conversation and people know how to use this service and what to expect. Um, we're approaching the end of the council year just to make sure that people don't believe we've forgotten. We're gonna finalize the ARPA applications. Even if we have to move committee meetings around, we're gonna identify next steps, if any, beyond that. Um, we're going to come back for a public restroom discussion, a council operating policy, and a discussion of a more balanced approach to unhoused individuals. And while I was sitting here, I get an email from the city clerk telling me that there's a typo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a big typo. Not too fast. Not yes. Oh, see, you saw. <laughs> Thanks for telling us. Okay. <laughs> 
So, uh, Councillor Sprague's item it is for to adopt the zoning changes uh, in order to come into compliance with LD 2003. It reads the planning board voted ought not to pass when in actuality they voted to pass it. Six to one. And yes, that's a big difference. Six to one. Okay. Yep. And I see your planning board chair is ought. So, <laughs> that's all I have. All right. All right. I move we go into executive sessions under one MRSA 4560 labor contract, executive session on MRSA 4560A personnel matter, and another personnel matter. Yeah, you got it. Okay. And we'll turn the air We have back. a motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. All right. Roll call votes. Yes. Councilor Fontier, Councilor Schaefer, Councilor Sprague. Yes. Councilor Tremble. Yes. Councilor Schaefer. Yes. Councilor Hogg. Yes. Councilor Yakabaga. Yes. Councilor Davit. Yes. yes. I'm doing this with my eyes shut. <laughs> now you're going to do it when you shut your eyes. That will be your night. 